Hello and welcome. I'm here at the wonderful United Nations in Vienna, Austria, at the Zero Project Conference when we're talking about zero barriers. We have hundreds of speakers here from around the world, more than 50 countries, and we have the best of the best. And so I'm delighted to be at this fireside chat with incredible innovators from England who are really breaking boundaries with accessibility. I am here with Ian McKinnon and Catherine Perry of Global Disability Innovation Hub. It is just fabulous to be with, uh, with you today. So please, Catherine, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your really exciting work. Thank you. That's a lovely introduction. Um, so my name is Catherine Perry and I'm lead for advocacy and engagement at GDI Hub. Um, we work across a whole uh, group of different areas from research to innovation, teaching, we implement programs and we work on advocacy. Ian. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. That's fantastic. Uh, my name is Ian McKinnon. I am one of the co-founders and directors of the Global Disability Innovation Hub and I lead our work on inclusive design, and that's primarily the inclusive design of the built environment, the world around us, and our cities. You are each working so much on inclusive design, and as we think about the future, there is no issue more important than climate change, and the intersection of that with people with disabilities is so important. Why is it that it's so important to work on inclusive design and climate change at the same time? Yeah, so thanks for that. I mean, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, inclusive design, climate change, and also AT, you know, we, we think should all be considered together. Um, for us, inclusive design is a, is a process, it's a methodology that really helps to create more inclusive outcomes. In the case of cities, applying an inclusive design process can yield more inclusive cities. We currently lead research on this as part of our 80-20-30 programme, which has a focus on developing countries in the Global South. Now, the reason that an AT programme is doing research on inclusive city design is because we know that it's all very well getting good quality, affordable AT to the people in greatest need. But if the environment in which they live still prohibits its use, then what's the point? So we know that AT and the environment are interlinked, um, but then in doing this research in the Global South as part of AT2030, we're working in, for example, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Varanasi in India, Surakarta in Indonesia, Nairobi in Kenya, and Freetown in Sierra Leone. Through this research and work, we have gained unique insights into the impact of climate change on the accessibility of these cities and the impact it's having on the lives of persons with disabilities. For example, how a lack of basic infrastructure in informal settlements is exacerbated hugely by extreme weather, and also how typical responses to climate change so often forget about the impact on people and on people's daily lives. So you know, from simple examples such as building buildings on raised plinths, uh, raised ground floors to avoid flooding, but in doing so, creating an access barrier. Um, think about ad hoc cycling infrastructure popping up in our cities. It's good green transport, but often forgets about uh, pedestrians, especially pedestrians with uh, sensory impairments and the impact on them. And then thinking about other kind of green public transport solutions that are proposed and put forward without thinking through the accessibility or inclusive nature of them. So the point is, you know, inclusive design of cities, uh, a response to climate change and access to AT, they're, they're all interlinked. Uh, and they all play a huge part in allowing persons with disabilities to live life to their full potential. And what we see at the moment right now with the impetus around the climate crisis is, a, is essentially a huge opportunity, an opportunity to ensure that we address sustainability and usability together, ensuring that we get all these developments right first time and for everyone. I'm really interested in specific barriers that you're working on. And when I think about cr climate change, I think of two sides of the same coin. On one hand, there's the prevention of Are you still disaster. there, Jennifer? And, uh, <laughs> you're not hearing me. 
on one hand, there's the prevention of the uh, of the disaster, and on the other hand, there's the dealing with the, um, the the different damage that happens with the climate events. So, what kinds of barriers are you facing, both the preventative uh, kinds or things for when there is a climate catastrophe? Yeah. So, I think obviously, climate uh, climate change and climate resilience strategies. Um, brings this issue forward more quickly because the rate of change in terms of attention being put on climate resilience strategies is, is enormous. Um, but we've we've had extreme weather patterns for a while, and in certain places like in Bangladesh, where you can expect you know uh, quite regular flooding, disabled people are usually left behind. The infrastructure doesn't really serve them. Um, in particular, I would say now as we sort of put a lot more attention on how we are coping with alternative weather patterns. We're, we're seeing at the moment that disabled people are not included in the conversation, certainly not well enough. So um, we had a side event at COP26 this year. It was one of four events, I think, on disability. The event wasn't accessible and therefore we really have to think about, you know, as these conversations happen in our sort of political classes, is the rhetoric really following the the reality? And I think the truth is not really. And if the past behaviour is anything to go by, um, I'd say the future isn't looking particularly bright, but the good news is that we can change it. And um, what we want to see is whether it's part of the climate resilience strategies or whether it's about humanitarian action or whether it's about um, facilitating greater flexibility and providing support to marginalised groups of people, of which persons with disabilities tend to be uh, included in that group, that there is um, networks there, that there is technology there, that there are support services there, and that the infrastructure works for them, regardless of whether it's a, a unique weather event or whether it's part of this climate resilience um, strategy that, that you know we're, we're seeing more of today. You mentioned how at the COP uh, conference, how the Israeli en energy minister who uses a wheelchair could not even access uh, this climate change uh, global event. Uh, we see other people with disabilities at the forefront of solutions, whether it's Greta Thunberg, who has autism, or Elon Musk, who also has autism and bipolar, um, who is doing electric cars and so many other technologies. What are you doing in terms of your initiative to ensure that people with disabilities themselves are centered in some of the problem solving and have access to whether it's the COP event or other kinds of uh, climate change activities and strategies. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. I mean, I'll, I'll take that, and, and Catherine, feel free to chip in. Um, but I, I think for us, through our existing work uh, and our partnerships, one of the things we're doing is, is creating an evidence base on this subject. Um, in particular, if I reference again the 802030 program and the outputs from that, we hope will help us arrive at recommendations that we hope we can use to inform a global strategy on disability inclusive climate resilient city design. And in particular, demonstrate how cities can implement real tangible positive change with you know, persons with disabilities at the centre of that change. Um, we're also leading the conversation with partners to keep this subject high on both the disability and the climate agendas, respectively. As you say, we, you know, we, we yes, we presented at COP26 last year. We presented at the Global Disability Summit last week. Um, we're also GDI Hub's also the world's first WHO official global collaboration centre on AT, which is based at University College London at UCL. Um, and we advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities across all of our work, um, including as a founding partner of the We the 15 movement. So, you know, GDI Hub is working across the board, really, to push this uh, agenda forward. Um, what I'd also like to, to say at this point is about, you know, the ask of others. So that's, that's kind of what, what we're focused on at the moment. But for others, how can they get involved in this work? And, and they ask the people watching today, watching this call at conference, you know, well, for us, we really want DPOs like disabled persons organisations, NGOs and other allies to turn their attention to climate as one of the biggest threats to disability inclusion globally. And we want to make sure that persons with disabilities have a strong voice, certainly a stronger voice on the climate stage 
Um, and so we seek partners and fellow advocates who want to join us in this work. We would ask others thinking about these topics, um, but perhaps don't know where to start, to get in touch, you know, ask for support, um, ask us about our work. Um, and But also, equally importantly, for people out there already doing great work on this, please let us know about it. You know, we, it's so important that good work gets the recognition and, and, and is elevated um, the way that it needs to. Um, I think also a point about education uh, uh, is important. Education on this subject is really, really important. And that's why a kind of core part of GDI Hub's work is around teaching and training uh, to help us spread this message far and wide. So that's a little bit about our work, but our ask of others, as it were, is to, to take this subject seriously, you know, um, to let us know if you need help or support in it, to share great examples of it, because our voices on this will be stronger together. So let's make sure that through our work, we're connected and having an impact far greater than the sum of our individual parts. I mean, ultimately, the end game for us is to have tangible, positive change on the ground. Um, and if that sounds like something you want to do, too, then please let us know about it. Yeah. And I just wanted to jump in and just add something else. And you asked, you know, what what do you know, Hub is doing to to ensure that disabled people are included in what we do and I should say that is literally our purpose <laughs> that's why we exist is to maximize the voices of disabled people so through all of our research through everything we do we make sure that we're talking to disabled people all the time at the end of the day what we want are solutions that work for disabled people for their families um, and, and for the wider community and we can't do that without including pe persons with disabilities in the conversation um, so if that for us is, is a norm and I think what we want to see is that that becomes the norm everywhere, all the time, and that it's included not as why are we talking about climate resilience and disability, but disability is embedded in those conversations from the beginning. And we don't need a fireside chat to talk about why they're so interlinked. Um, I'd love that to be more widely understood. Thanks. Catherine Perry and Ian McKinnon, you've been absolutely terrific here today. Global Disability Innovation Hub is online. Lots of tools, lots of information. You really help people make their work accessible. Um, you're really on the front lines globally, providing concrete solutions to access to inclusion and thinking towards a world that is safe for every kind of living being. So I really want to thank you all for being uh, with us, both of you, and to your entire your teams for the tremendous work that you are doing. We are here at the United Nations in Vienna. There are hundreds of speakers here. Um, we have hundreds of speakers from around the world, thousands of people watching from every country. I want to thank you for the uh, work you're doing on climate change, which is so important and bringing accessible technology to the future. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks.